today. We're really excited that this June sees the publication of our very first children's book, The Place for Me, which last week um, became a number one Amazon bestseller on the oral and cultural history list. And Quincy the Comedian is one of the authors in the book who've written brand new stories for children and young people about the Windrush generation and Windrush history. So my name is Erika Oka, I'm BCA's Managing Director. I will be just introducing Quincy today who will read from his story or possibly just do it from memory, uh, apparently. It's just an amazing skill. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll also take some questions and answers. Um, this is being streamed to YouTube as well, and we have live captioning. Um, so if you require captioning and you're logged into the YouTube, you simply go to the bottom of the screen where it says CC, and then you click show subtitle, and then you'll be able to see the captions. Okay, guys, so I'm going to melt into the background and leave you with Quincy, the comedian, broadcaster, and uh, radio broadcaster, radio comedian. broadcaster, comedian, father granddad, father granddad um, from a family that um, I think it says in the book that you're Barbadian. Barbadian, Barbadian yeah, Barbadian. Yeah. Uh, that's where my mum and dad are from. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've probably got some other families in different parts of the Caribbean, but I haven't mm -hmm. searched that deep as yet. But yeah, no doubt. Your so, family. Your so family. the Windrush story is really close to your family, basically. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Well, after you read your story, I'll be really interested to hear where the inspiration came from, because from the little bio in the book, it sounds like it was quite a personal yes. inspiration. Yes, yeah. yeah. Be... All right. I'm going to hand over to Quincy now. Thanks, everybody. Hi. So I'm going to just, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to log off here and come back on in a second, uh, Instagram. Um, what I would do. Right, so um, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for taking your time out, um, even though the sun is out, for taking time out to, uh, to listen to myself. I am a, a stand-up comedian um, and radio broadcaster, and I have had the pleasure of writing in this particular uh, book um, and uh, called uh, Place for Me, Windrush Stories. And Windrush Generation is very important to me because um, it wasn't for the Windrush Generation, I wouldn't be here. Um, my mum and dad just came after the Windrush, but I had an uncle, a uh, late uncle who came on the Windrush and um, brought my mum over and uh, the, rest is, the rest is history. So I'm just going to just read here. Um, I think to make it even more interesting, I, what I would probably do is um, read some of the passages from the story, but because uh, I know the story because it's very personal to me, I would say that it is, right? So here we go. Um, Every young person has goals, dreams and ambitions. Mine was to become a tailor of suits. I dreamed of becoming a tailor since I was a young boy in Barbados. Watching the fresh uh, movies from the States in the, and in the UK at the cinemas. Even more, the actors' costumes. I used to admire the clothes of the touring countries who played the West Indies cricket team. How smart they looked on and off the pitch. I thought to myself, one day I'm going to either play for the West Indies team or make their suits. Growing up, money wasn't flowing. We couldn't afford new clothes, but we, with help from my mother, I always tried to make my school uniform look a little different from the rest of the classmates. My mom was an expert with the needle and thread. She could uh, make anything from curtains to bed sheets. At the local market, we wandered up and down the uh, rows hunting for fabrics. As I grew up, I came to recognize good quality cloth off the back of what my mum taught me. One time the West Indies were playing England and I asked a friend who worked at the club to sneak me in to the cricket ground, not just to see my beloved West Indies, but to get a closer look of the outfits of both teams. As the captains came to the field for the toss, I admired their smart jackets made in light material to keep them cool under the hot sun. 
I was also passionate about becoming a tailor. When opportunity, opportunity came to go to England to work in a clothes factory, I knew I had to take it. My cousin Kevin already worked in, um, at the factory making garments for English stores. When he wrote to my mother and mentioned his company were looking to recruit new workers, she saw uh, what a brilliant chance this was for me. I was so excited to chase my dream to becoming a tailor. I would have left Barbados without packing my own clothes. My mother brought me back to reality, making long lists of all the things I needed I need in England and uh, stitching extra layers into my favorite shirts so I wouldn't be too cold. A few weeks later, I boarded a ship bound to England. I was fascinated by the stories of the other passengers. Some of them were traveling to, to be with their family. The last time that boy stepped foot in Mayhouse, he was so small, couldn't read, write, nothing. No, he's writing me letters. My wife thinks that I'm going to write once I get there. Once she eventually uh, re reach the Lord's she's going to reach, I'm going to say, when I reach England, all the pens and papers ran out. Some, like me, were following opportunities and smart adventures. They were hoping to get jobs in transport and other new national health service, which provided free health care for everyone. They hoped that when they came back home, they could tell stories about what they had done to help the, the motherland. When I arrived at the dock, I had to raise my jacket collar to combat the cold breeze whilst against my neck. My teeth were chattering, it was, and it was May. That couldn't be right. As soon as I could get hold of some fab uh, heavy fabric, I would make some gloves and hats and a scarf. Once the paperwork was all filled out, I headed towards the coke station to meet my cousin. Winston! Kevin's voice called. We hugged each other and I held on uh, at that second, uh, second too long trying to absorb some of the heat from his coat. I'd never seen so much white people at, um, at once. I wondered uh, why so many of them were staring at us. They were all smartly dressed and in a rush going to, know, going to uh, nowhere knows. We got to the coast, traveled into London, I looked out of the window at the masses of green, thinking how many cricket games I, I could play here. Wake up. You want to get to the uh, you want to get to the factory late. I told the boss about you, and first impressions counts over here. I blinked as Kevin's face swam into focus above me. I've fallen asleep almost as soon as I got into my new room uh, the night before. My cousin lived down the corridor and we shared a kitchen and a bathroom and lots of people. I got out of the bed and began putting on my clothes as quickly as possible. It was so cold. Luckily, I kept my socks on overnight so at least my feet were, weren't freezing. What's the boss's name? I asked. Mr. Tardelli, he's Italian, now hurry up. On the bus, I recognize the conductor's accent as he asks for the fare, a fellow Barbadian. As we pulled up to the uh, stop outside the factory, I saw a steady flow of workers clocking into the building. I followed Kevin through the factory. There were fabric all around, all different colors, textures, and patterns. The sound of hundreds of sewing machines rattled and there, were, there was a radio playing in the background. I heard snippets of conversations from workers scattered around the factory, factory floor. As busy as elves working on a Christmas Eve, I felt like it was heaven without the heating. This was the start of my journey to become a tailor. Eventually, we arrived outside Mr. Tardelli's office. Through the glass, I could see a small man on the phone and smoking. He glanced up and beckoned us in. I've got to go now, he was saying loudly into the phone. 
Just make sure I get what I ordered. He turned to Kevin, sorry about that. Business is business. How are you, my friend? My cousin and Mr. Tardelli exchanged pleasantries and Kevin introduced me. I've been told um, back home, you were a bit of a dab hand um, at making clothes, said Mr. Tardelli. I replied with a nod. I've also been told you're very, uh, a very hard worker, like your cousin here. Yes, I said. I hope to become a tailor someday. I love to have my own shop and make clothes for, my, uh, for famous people. This was met with a smile by the boss. I like this one, he said, putting his arm around me. His cigarette smoke swirled around my face. He's got ambition and dreams. Let's see how long it lasts when the English weather kicks in. We start you off with pressing. I put you next to old John. He showed you the ropes. I could see from John's face that I wasn't the first guy he has shown, shown the ropes. He had words, West Ham, tattooed on his knuckles. What team do you support? He asked as I sat down at the workstation next to him. Team? Team, mate. Football. John peered at me suspiciously. You do like football, right? Don't tell me. You're a cricket fan, probably. I nodded and, uh, and he sighed. The ball's too small. The only thing I like about cricket is five days without seeing the missus. Football is 90 minutes, 90, 90 minutes though. Shouldn't that give you enough time to spend time with your wife? I replied cheekily. John laughed and I felt relieved um, to have broken uh, the ice. I like you, you're quick witted. If you're nice as your cousin, it says you are, I'll take you to see my beloved West Ham someday. He started to show me how to press and finishing garments. He was a good teacher and I picked it up quickly. Around the factory floor, there were several large buckets filled with cloth. Every now and again, a worker tossed a piece of material into the bucket. What do you do with that fabric? I asked John. It's scrap from the cutting department. Um, don't use it, he replied. It gets chucked at the, chucked at the end of the week. It, I was amazed at the amount of fabric thrown away as I, could, um, as I caught the bus home that night. I kept thinking all about the things my mum could create with uh, unused material. I seem to, it seemed a shame for it to go to waste. Over the next few weeks, I settled, I settled into my job at the factory. Um, I, I soon built up the courage to ask the Mr. Tardelli about the scrap material. He didn't have a problem with me taking some of it home. So I saved up for my own sewing machine and mannequin and began practice, uh, practice tailoring in my spare time. When the guys from the factory went to the pub after work, I honed my craft and tried to copy the suits I'd seen in the cinema screens back home and the famous cricketers who I hoped to see play in England someday. It was hard work, but my dreams of becoming a tailor drove me forward. As the months went by, I gathered more fabric and learned to make everything from shirts to free, uh, full three-piece suits. Soon, word spread that I could make clothes and people were knocking on my door, asking me to make all kinds of things from school uniforms to suits and uh, for special occasions. I became the go-to tailor for the Caribbean community. I was proud to send home a, a bit of extra money each time I wrote to my mum telling her of my progress in England. One day, I got to work early and bumped into John, who was snooping around my station. Have you lost something? I asked. Heading over, I came, I came in early to drop off a ticket for you to see West Ham against Fulham. You said you like to see flash suits, didn't you? Well, that's what the players wear before the start of the game. Think of it as a leaving present. But I'm, I'm not leaving, I said. No, you're not, I am. John replied, 
he told me that his time at the factory was done and he trained me, uh, trained me well, well enough to continue the job. He was going to work for his son-in-law. Thanks for the ticket, but John, at your age, shouldn't you be retiring and relaxing, I said? John laughed and collected his hat and, um, and coat. I'll retire soon. I'm just gonna help out my son-in-law for a bit of uh, posh new, uh, his posh new shop. And then, uh, and that's me finished. And then when West Ham win the FA Cup, I come to a cricket match with you. I buy you a ticket to the West Indies game someday, I told him. Then we will see the, a real match, like, like, a big pun. Then we'll see what a real match is like. We hugged and then I wished him the best uh, for his team and the future. Take this card. It's my son's son-in-law's shop. Anytime you want a nice suit, come and see, come and see him. John handed me a business card as I glanced and uh, at the address, Savile Row. All the finest tailors worked on that street. I put it in my wallet with a smile. Time passed. I worked at the factory and made clothes in the evening and uh, at the weekends. I got to order. I got to order for, uh, for a wedding um, to make suits for the groom, best man and the ushers. It was a big job, which could earn enough money to get my own place, which the room uh, for my stock. As I was sewing, one afternoon, Kevin walked in all excited. What are you smiling for? I asked. You see that girl? I tell you about every day who lived on the street. Well, I catch a deal. We you're always stuck in this room, like like an elf making clothes. I told her to bring a friend, and I'll bring you double deal. The news went through me like an electric bolt, which uh, so much that I took my eye off, the, off my sewing machine and caught my hand. I yelped in pain. I knew my injury was bad when my cousin called the Lord's name. I lifted my, my hands to control the bleeding and Kevin picked up some scrap uh, material and covered it. At the hospital, they stitched my cut, put it on a bandage and told me that I'd be out of action for a while. The news was devastating. I've never been able to make those wedding suits now. And even working at the factory, it would be difficult. Mr. Tardelli wasn't best pleased and I was reduced to doing simple jobs around the factory. Even after my hand healed, I found it difficult to build up the business again. It seemed my dream of becoming a tailor with my own shop and famous clients would never come true. I was pretty low until one day, I heard some exciting news. The West Indies cricket team was coming to England on a tour in the summer. This was my opportunity to see my heroes outside of Barbados. I had enough money to buy a ticket instead of sneaking into the ground as I had back, back home. There was one person I wanted to take to the match with me. I caught a bus to London's West End, gazing at the windows at the uh, glittering buildings. So tall, they almost touched the sky. I got to my destination and checked the address on the cards. I still kept in my wallet. The tidy row of shops with their windows full of crisp shirts and smart suits made me feel overwhelmed. I took off my hat, opened the door. The smell of fresh material washed over me as I stepped inside. Good afternoon, sir. Can I help you? A gentleman asked, hurrying over to me. Yes. I was looking for, uh, for this card eh, by a friend of mine who helped me when I first came to this country. His name is John. Is he here by any chance? You're not Winston, are you? The gentleman, the gentleman asked. He broke into a smile and when I nodded, John was, was speaking about you last week. He said you might pop in one day. He asked me um, to wait while he went in the back to fetch John. I looked. I looked around the shop, admiring the suits and the matching shoes. It must cost an arm and a leg to buy in here, I muttered to myself, far more than I was normally uh, charged. John came out with, uh, through the door at the back of the shop with a tape measure around his neck. Winston, he cried. 
I said, I'll come and see you when the West Indies came over. I told him, I'm going to show you how to celebrate cricket West Indies style, West Indian style. I've bought you a ticket. Consider it as a thank you present for helping me when I first arrived. John replied with a wave of his hands. Um, he introduced me to his son-in-law, Michael, and the gentleman who, uh, who had greeted me when, I, when I, I came into the shop. I told him all about my dream to become a, becoming a tailor. I mentioned my injury and how I've been, been finding it difficult to, and hard to get my business back up and running. The conversation flowed and uh, at some points I felt like uh, it was an interview. It was nice to hear about Michael's success. I'm actually hoping up another shop soon. We've already had some famous clients booked in, Michael told me. What are your plans over the weekend? It's the grand opening. The opening day came, came around and I dressed up to my finest attire. The new shop was just as stylish as the several row stores. John introduced me to his family and his friends. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Michael announced, I hope to make this shop just as successful as my original. In every shop you need good staff and someone to manage those staff. Now, the person I have in mind doesn't know it yet, but I hope they will take this opportunity to follow their dreams and run this new venture. Michael called me over. I was confused, but moved towards him. He leaned over and whispered in my ear, I would love if you managed my shop, Winston. I was overwhelmed, but before I could reply, I was projected uh, across the room. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our new manager and wonderful tailor, Winston, and our first client, the West Indies cricket team, will be coming in for their suits fitting tomorrow. My emotions got the better of me as tears of joy flowed down my face. Every young person has goals and ambitions. Every young person has a dream and mine was about to come through. Thank you so much, Quincy. I love it. I love the almost fairy tale ending. Yeah. When I read that and he said about the West Indian cricket team coming in, I was like, oh. yeah. I, I literally like, went, oh. it's his dream. Yeah, it's his dream. No, it's, it's something which is close to my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was a, a great love of, of, of uh, cricket. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of, a lot of my family are great lovers of cricket. So uh, I entwined the story with, with some of my dad's memory. Okay. Yeah, and did you, was your dad a tailor? No, my, my, my dad, uh, he had a cousin who was a tailor, but my dad actually was uh, in the army. Okay. So he came over here and served for the British Army. So he was in Windrush then? He was pre-Windrush, do you think? No, he not? was just, just, just after. Oh, okay. So it was my my mum's uncle mm -hmm. was the Windrush. He came over here. I see. Worked okay. in the Mint. Um, the Mint? Until were, yeah, the Mint was like a, a, a money money place. Oh, like the actual, where they, like with the with Royal with, Mint, where they yeah, print cash. Yeah, so that's cool. what they did, yeah. That's quite fancy. It was amazing. <laughs> Very trustworthy. That was a beautiful reading. Thank you so much. Um, and it was streamed to our YouTube as well. So we'll do an edit of the one on YouTube Thank just you to much. make it as exciting as possible. Cheers. But yeah, I, I love that story. And I was very, I feel like it had some twists and turns in it, actually. Like when John was first introduced and he had like West Ham tattooed on his knuckles. And then yeah. you say like, oh, he looked at me as if. I'm not the first person. And I was like, oh, where is this relationship going to go? And then it turned out that John was actually like sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I suppose I had to look at it in a point of view as well was that you've got this mass, um, uh, uh, loads of people coming over from different cultures mixing. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I had to think of what, how would, how would John feel? Sure. Um, he's been told to train up somebody. Um, and this is probably his 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 journey, and it's like oh, I'm not doing this again. So where is where is he going to go? Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to make that because he was 
from West Ham East End mm -hmm. and the two cultures because I'm British from East End as well. I was going to say which bit of London yeah, are you from? Yeah, okay, So okay. I wanted the, the two cultures because mm -hmm. they're both working class um, indirectly. So they have that that, that combination of yeah. working class uh, cultures fusing together, just culturally different. And I think it's nice then in that sense because it's the two working class men like coming together yeah. and like going to Savile Row. Yes. Yeah. So they share that journey in actual yeah. fact. So yeah, and it, it, it happened to be John was a guy who was probably underrated in the factory because mm -hmm. he ended up helping his son in law, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, in making the suits. So him training there was just like a probably he's just done it for the family. So um, it's just different people with different dreams at different times. Sure, sure. You know? And did they go and see the cricket together in the end? Uh, they certainly did. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned 1975 because that was the first time, that was the first World Cup um, in was held in England, which West Indies won. Ah, and, um, nice was, extra bit of history just dropping yeah. for you there. Fantastic. Yeah, so yeah, there was, I think they played Australia. I think it was Australia. But yeah, so between seventies, mid seventies up to like the late nine, early mid nineties, West Indies were the dominant West Indies uh, dominant cricket team in the there world. There you go, fantastic. Yeah. And um, he gets to make their suits. Yes, he does. Yeah, he gets to make their suits. <laughs> yes. and, yeah. Now um, we just have a few people in the Zoom room, so. You're very welcome to either type a question into the chat or you can unmute your microphone and speak a question if you like. Um, but while you're thinking about it, um, I'll just ask a couple more questions and we've just got maybe five more minutes for questions. Okay. Um, so one of my questions is about how you came to write a story in this book, like what happened? So I was approached by my um, uh, agent, Mm -hmm. um, and I would say during the lockdown, I, I found myself on the radio doing a lot of stories, telling okay. a lot of stories. Yeah. And I was approached about it. And the Windrush generation means a lot to me. Um, and um, I, I was sent some audio of some of the individuals when they first right. came to this country. Mm -hmm. That's from our from, archives here. Yeah, from and the, you can actually find some of that audio on Black Cultural Archives website as well. So original testimonies. Yeah. And it was what really fascinated me that I was totally unaware of there was archive footage mm -hmm. uh, and audio mm -hmm. of all the majority of these people yeah. came to this country. Yeah. And the one that stuck out to me, which was was the I think his name is Michael. Um, awesome. what, what stuck out for me was his, his love for clothes. And also when you see the footage of the Windrush generation, when they came here, they were dressed immaculately. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They were dressed immaculately. Yeah. And there's something which is interesting. I think that's culture. something that the, that the illustrator yeah. tried to recreate on the book. Yeah, definitely. You definitely. know, that's something that the Windrush generation, I think, are really known for. Yeah, and I think that comes from a religious point of view as well. When mm -hmm. on a Sunday, I mean, everybody's dressed in the nines and mm -hmm. it's, it's putting on a good impression. Yeah, and um, pride. Yeah, pride, yeah. And just general style. Yeah, yeah, style. <laughs> like always, innate style, you know. It's, it's not... always that thing of uh, in the Caribbean household is when you leave your house, your house mm -hmm. represents you. I think it's a working class thing as well. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Around the world. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so you've been really shy, everybody, with your questions. So I can ask a few more questions because I'm I'm really really interested. That's right. So I'd like to know a bit more about you, actually, Quincy. So you know, you do you do all sorts of things. Would you class yourself as an influencer? <laughs> I will. I will class myself as an influencer. I hope you've got to By the way, I'm like an anti. I don't know about these things. So this is why I'm I asking the question. I think influencers. <laughs> Influencers are uh, sorry. Influencers, you can't class them as influencers individually. I think people have to tell you that mm -hmm. uh, oh, you, okay. you, you left. You've oh, I'm so influenced sorry. Okay. Into you, you must, you must be an Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I think that's blame, I think it's more of a case of blaming young Trump here. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but how did you? Because words, I think, are really important to you. Yes. So tell so, us a bit about about that so for me um growing up I, I wasn't 
I wasn't a, a big reader, uh, so to speak. I wasn't a massive reader, but I used to love being read to. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was one of the the mechanisms what kept me quiet. Okay. And I used to, I used to, and I, I always get um, um, really massively induced by words. So okay. if, if it's a word I haven't heard before, mm-hmm. um, it's something which, what does that word mean? Mm-hmm. Or um, why do they say that in a particular sentence? So I was always into like words um, and uh, it's to help me because I'm growing up like speech wise, sure. I wasn't really that good. Okay. You know what I mean? And hence why I probably got into comedy because I could vocally pronounce and, and and fit words into into certain things. You mean like the rhythm you could rhythm, control yeah. it? And yeah. The, yeah. And listening to like when I used to go to church with my uh, family members, listen to how influencers like reverends and pastors, so to speak, okay. um, how they use words. And and I used to really be fascinated how they can take the Bible and translate the Bible into everyday. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, yeah, kind of, of take it and then yeah. apply it. So it actually, yeah. which is you know, which is what I've done to this to, to this to, to this story. book. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. I think that was our intention, uh, BCA, and also the publisher Scholastic's intention was to try and create something that could actually tell these stories in a human way. Yeah. So there's lots of fact files in the book. There's like pictures from the archive and yeah. you know facts and figures. But what brings you really close is actually the stories, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea what you guys created. So I think that my, my children, my grandchildren um, need to see these stories and the fact that they're now, what this means a lot to me, um, that my, um, my name is documented mm-hmm. and the, sto- the story is documented. Mm-hmm. I see that, um, is it Malo or is it Abigail Webster's raise the hand? Um, by all means, um, you can, if you're comfortable with being broadcast to YouTube, you can turn your video on, um, but you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hello. 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 Um, I wanted to ask a question. Okay. Then. Um, my question was, was this book inspired by making children learn about Windrush? This this book was probably inspired by um, the the fact of we tend to not learn from history, I'll probably do one of the things. But for me, writing this story, it was inspired by listening to my, my father and the Windrush generation. And we are from culturally, uh, where, where are you from, Marlo? My parents are from Jamaica. Jamaica, right. So, I'm England. You're, you're England, yeah? Okay, then, all right. Good luck Tuesday. Um, <laughs> What you find is that in the West Indian culture, we tell a lot of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that from that point of view, we vocalize it, but we don't, we don't put it down. Um, so it's, it's documented. And um, so it was important for me and I was inspired to take those same stories, which I grew up on um, and journeys from my family and friends and apply it to, 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 this, to this book. On the stories in this book so um it's it's always there yeah it's always there so that's what i was inspired um by the the audio um and also inspired by by family and friends i think that's such thank a powerful you. Thing. Oh. thank you you take care so have a good day have a great day pop down to brixton if you're in london and come and see us i think we're open till about four-ish today we're coming yeah so Quincy might be staying, so you might be able to meet him. In yeah, person. I'll be. I'll, I'll be staying. I'll be staying for a little while. I'm just gonna leave soon. Oh, okay, great. Well, we can wrap this up so you can leave. <laughs> uh, 
All right, Quincy, thank you so, 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 so much, not only for writing this beautiful story thank and you. being part of this, this book, which I am personally just incredibly excited about. It's BCA's first ever children's book. Um, for those of you who are coming down today, you'll might meet Aisha, who's our learning manager. She's the one who actually made this book happen, the, what, the person from BCA that made this book happen. She was very stubborn and she kept working and working to make the book happen and we feel like this book is our legacy for the current generation to try and bridge that from the memories and the stories of the that first generation that um that we call windrush now yeah. and the current generation and then the children that are around now so this is our bridge and this is our legacy so thank you so much for joining us today thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you very much for everything i appreciate it and we'll now be ending the event. Bye, everybody.